Square Ball Podcast. Welcome to the show, brought to you with Michael. Astonish. Yep. Cleaning products for your house, for you. Mold and Mildew Blaster, there you go. Is that the UK's number one? I, p- I believe so, yeah. I absolutely believe there so. There you go. I've not found any in this studio yet. Do you know what, uh, do you know what they say about it as well? If I see any, <laughs> you know I'll blast it. Do you know what they say as well? Great value. Value products. I, mean, um, I, I do genuinely buy it, so it must be great value. Yeah. Because I'm a tight man. Born and bred in Leeds. I drove past um, Astonish HQ um, the other day on my way into work. That was exciting. I had a, a little, oh, there it is. <laughs> Did they invite you in? Uh, I wasn't that close to when okay. uh, wasn't within waving distance, but I fully expect I would have been if they'd have noticed that mm. I was I was um, I was driving past. Do you know what, the, what I like about the chemicals in there? No harsh ones. Oh, that is good. Yeah. That is good. No corrosives. Officially certified, cruelty free and vegan, which is important to people as well. Um, ethical household and personal care cleaning products made in Yorkshire. Um, should mention as well that Howard, who owns Astonish, is on the Leeds Business Podcast um, in the next week or so. So, if you want to uh, know more about Howard, how is Howard? And the family, do you, you, you see him at Christmas? Oh, he's great, yeah. yeah. He's great and entirely free of mould and mildew. <laughs> which, you, which you absolutely would expect, <laughs> wouldn't you? Astonish.co.uk for details of the Astonish products. And thank you to Astonish for their support as well. Phil, let's um, save ourselves from this um, this commercial morass then and reflect on Leeds beating QPR and looking ahead to Bristol City at the weekend heading into the international break. Go. What do you make of Leeds United then, actually? What, where, what, do we, what are we seeing now in Leeds United, do you think? Well, one of the things we're seeing is us creeping into the championship slog, aren't we, of game after game after game. How many games does it feel like we've played by this point? Ten. Do you think it feels like ten? <laughs> no, it feels it like... It feels like sli- more. slightly yeah. more. Slightly more. And quite a few games that are feeling like several others that you've seen as well, which is kind of kind of this league. There isn't a lot of differentiation between team after team in the way that when you're up in the Premier League, they were so distinct. Manchester City, Liverpool, Manchester United, Arsenal, whoever came, you kind of knew who you're playing against. Whereas the games in this division where you feel like you could just swap the shirts and it would carry on um, in the same in the same vein. Did you enjoy last night? Uh, last night, as we're recording, yeah, we're recording on Thursday ahead of Farkas Press Conference, should say that. Um, this will be out on Friday. Did I enjoy it? Yeah, I think on reflection I did. It wasn't the most sparkling occasion, was it? It wasn't it was quite flat in the stadium, I thought, and I thought the I thought the early goal, as I said on the match ball, I thought the early goal would open it up, would make more of a contest of it. But we were kind of baffled, weren't we, that QPR just seemed to revert to type, even though they were one down. They were just still sticking with their five at the back, four in front, one man up front thing, which is which, as you say, is exactly what we saw from we saw it from West Brom, we saw it from Watford. Everyone's doing it. I think the threat to Leeds was, as the second half went on, was that Leeds were going to do something stupid and we're going to let QPR in because although it did get a bit tense, having looked back at the game today, this morning, it didn't ever really look like QPR were going to take something from that. And I know there was the red card towards the end, which we'll, we, we'll probably get into, I think. But it the only difference that made was that for the six minutes that remained, QPR didn't have Lyndon Dykes up front who they could have aimed, you know, long balls to which was pretty much the strategy in injury time was to hoof it towards the edge of the box hope for a bit of a flick on which Dykes did get at one point drew that save from from Melier but that and the the chance for um, Armstrong really late in the first half was was about it um, and Leeds I felt bossed it right to um, the uh, right to half time you saying there that it was very flat I was about to type that actually just as Somerville scored or as that attack started to get going just to say it's been a bit kind of low key in here and there was the ch- the chance for Gray to shoot which he didn't take but that aside in the first 10 minutes it had been all quite um, stodgy and, and not too much happening I think when Somerville scored a good finish it was an easy chance but took it took it really well you thought right okay well this could develop quite nicely into 2-0, 3-0, 4-0 in the way that it did against Watford um, but with Farker and you're asking what you know what making the leads at the moment what, what they are just now after the Southampton game, he was quite, I don't know if defensive is the word, but he was quite resistant to some of the questions that were being put to him. He didn't think that there was an issue at centre-back between Cooper and Stroik, and obviously he'd chosen to go with that partnership because he had Rodon back. thought Rodon made a, a good difference again last night against QPR. Um, he didn't feel that his system was a particular issue. He didn't feel like he needed to shift to midfield three to combat Southampton's. He thought the first goal might have been offside. He felt that Somerville being off the pitch had affected um, the second goal. And when you watched it back, I'm not really sure that that was, was actually the case. I think in 
you know, the, from what he was saying, he was trying to give the impression of someone who didn't think an awful lot had actually gone wrong at Southampton, even though it kind of looked to the naked eye like it hadn't been anywhere near perfect. But he did say after the game yesterday and after the win over QPR that he was really happy and he was really pleased precisely because a day like that at Southampton does tend to give your confidence a bit of a knock. And, and it, it does make players who otherwise had been you know, developing nicely as a team through the previous three or four weeks and starting to look like they were on a bit of a roll. It does put question marks in your head about why did that happen? What went wrong? Um, was it our fault? Was it just one of those days? So important to win against QPR, I think, and particularly important to win because of what's going on at the top of the table at the moment. You, you've got to keep pace with that to, to some extent. Um, and two home games in a week, opportunity for six points. Um, it it kind of had to start as it as it did last night. I was thinking back to the, this morning to the match ball and also just the general atmosphere in the ground. I feel like maybe we were a bit ungrateful for last night because it was a very comfortable win. And 1 0 is fine, isn't it? Yeah, I, th- I, think, I think it just came off the back of Watford where there was, it felt like there was a lot more entertainment to it and it felt we were more, I know, a bit more freewheeling and like we could have stayed there all day. Whereas yesterday it felt like full time came around after what was eventually 12 minutes and everyone was a bit like, oh, oh thank God that's oh, done. Oh, good. Oh, good. We can go home. But, but it's going to be like that because there's so many games. And one of the crucial aspects when it comes to getting out of the championship is that you do have to grind through some of them. And that was certainly the case last night. Um, from half time onwards it was a grind and it was a, a bit of a slog and it was one of those fixtures where you had to make sure it happens because the little 1-0 wins that you can throw in amongst much better performances or much better results really do really do help you one of the things that I'm noticing at the moment and I've noticed all season actually particularly since the end of the transfer window when things have kind of settled at Leeds is the number of opposition managers who are speaking pretty highly about Farkas' side. And Ainsworth was another of those last night who sat down and said, look, they are going to be absolutely there or thereabouts at the end of the season. Now, when he says there or thereabouts, I don't know whether he means top two or whether he means playoffs, but he clearly thinks that this is a a kind of side with promotion credentials built, made of, of promotion material. And he's not at all the first coach to say that. He... I don't know if I'd go as far as to say he was happy with the 1-0 defeat because it, it wouldn't be like that. But I think his view was that it's quite easy to turn up to Ellen Road against this Leeds team and take a good pace. In. Um, and, and he thinks other teams will. Watford already have. OK, it wasn't it wasn't as if the scoreline totally ran away. Um, but they were heavily beaten on the day. Um, so from his perspective, he was looking at Leeds and thinking, good team. Um, but there's no doubt at all that in the second half... QPR started to take a few more risks. They started to play a little bit further up the pitch. It didn't give Leeds as much time on the ball and Leeds weren't really able to reassert themselves. And then that psychological aspect did come into play with the crowd and and with the players as well of thinking if they nick a goal at the end of this, it'll be be a proper, you know, proper result wasted. But as as they were doing that, Phil, I think part of what flattened it was that Leeds were never out of control either. There was never any real getting in behind us or moments of jeopardy. So it was kind of just two equal and opposing forces almost cancelling each other out, I think. I think that's that sort of partly flattened it. And I think, yeah. I don't think it's that we were ungrateful for the win. I think, it, you know, wins have been so scarce over the last year or so that maybe we should, have been, we should have been a bit more enthusiastic about it. But you can't, you know, you can't pretend it was kind of a swashbuckling buckling occasion. Like you didn't come out of it in the same way you did after Watford thinking that was great fun because I think we're seeing, um, for the most part, we've got a team in, in the Leeds team that's clearly better than the vast majority of opponents that it comes up against. And then they just go out and do what they do, which is set up in a 4-2-3-1 or thereabouts. And it either works, as it did towards the end against Watford, and it's fun, or it occasionally doesn't against teams that, for whatever reason, just have your number like Southampton. And we don't really vary up that much. So you can, you know what you're going to get. It almost resembles like a training exercise to a certain it's- extent. And and it's can Leeds break this team down? So there's there's less kind of... I don't know. There's less thrill to some of it. It's all. It's like it's like machine-like, if you like. But that's two occasions now where Leeds have broken down teams who have come to to sit in Watford and um, and QPR. Michael and I were speaking off mic before we started recording about the Sheffield Wednesday game, which is starting to look more and more like a, a serious opportunity missed, particularly because of their horrendous goal difference. Not to mention the generally horrendous results in and league position. Um, but one of the one of the hard things about the Championship particularly when you don't feel like you're just making up the numbers in it, is that the the thing that's in everybody's head is the end game and the end game is promotion and the playoffs, which 
at this stage is, is still miles away, not just in terms of points, but in terms of time, you know, months to go before you get to the end of the season. And, you know, you, you go through weeks where three games in a week, which personally, in, in certain periods, I love because, you know, the games are the things that are, are really, really fun to cover. But there are times where you feel like that's all you're doing. You know, it's just like game press conference. Sometimes we're seeing Farker, you know, like five times in a week and you're genuinely sitting down thinking, OK, well, we could go over Pero at 10 again or should you be playing Rodon? Um, but you've had that discussion already through the week and it's just the kind of old ground that, that you go through because it, it is so back to back. Um, and it, I guess it, it must mean that for sections of the crowd, some supporters... There'll be periods of the season where you do think, we just want to get through this, you know, just want to get through this period, get through these this month, just get results on the board so that you kind of know where it's going and you feel a bit happier and a bit more confident. And I think a game like QPR at home last night is one of those where ideally you'd like to be putting them away comfortably and ideally you wouldn't have had the kind of tension of those 12 minutes, 30 minutes of injury time last night. But it just needed to be a win on the board. And I think, again... Leeds had to play much better than they did at Southampton and they certainly did last night. It was a totally different game and while I do think that Rodon made a difference again to the defence and it was the right decision to recall him, in no way was the pressure that Leeds were under last night the same um, as they were under at, at St Mary's but they did manage the game an awful lot better yesterday. Um, but it, it it is the case that they just needed to win that last night. It was important to win that game, I think. Yeah, can I just ask actually about the um, you know questioning... Farker and, and managers in general as well. Is there is there kind of a delicate dance that you need to do as a journalist? Because I think it'd be useful for fans to get kind of an insight into this. In that, so we can all see that the defence looked weaker against Southampton, and I yeah. I would argue that it looked stronger against QPR with Rodon back in there. And I think there's there's a sort of a, almost a demand from fans saying why aren't the journalists pushing this point more? But you can't really just go in there and constantly hammer the same points, can you? Or, or, or what? You know, is it a delicate dance there? It's is a it? balance because, and obviously every situation is different. So sometimes you get decisions made by a manager that are quite clearly wrong and quite clearly go badly wrong. And you can press them on that and you can, you know, you can kind of contest answers which deflect from, from what's really happened. I think with Farker, it, it was... It was not unreasonable to decide that he was going to go with Cooper and strike at Southampton. I think that's his his prerogative. I think if you start to get a pattern of seeing that, you know, that, that partnership's been picked regularly and is not working or is causing an issue, then it becomes far more contentious. I think it was very fair and questions were asked of him about Rodon. Um, I asked the Rodon question at St Mary's, you know, and I said to him, he has been really good this season. So it was a surprise that he was left out. And Farker's answer was that he hasn't been totally perfect and he does like Cooper um, he's asked again about it on Tuesday and I think it is just that balance between not labouring a point that they've gone over I mean we had this so much with Bielsa about Tyler Tyler Roberts and Joe Gelhart round and round and round of the feeling and I think we shared this feeling that Gelhart should be playing more Gelhart was more influential to our eyes than, than Roberts every time you asked Bielsa about it Bielsa's attitude was I think Roberts fits better than Gelhart I think um, Roberts offers us more in the situations where I'm taking him off the bench um, therefore I'm playing him and at that point there's very little you can say apart from well I disagree because yeah. it's, it comes down to you've had your answer haven't you've you you've had your answer but yeah. also more to the point it's his call you know, yeah. it's his call. And in the end, managers do answer for the calls that they make. So they do have to get it right more often than not. Or what happens is they, they lose their jobs. But no, absolutely. It's a little like that with the, the Piro situation because we're going through, we're going through a cycle at the moment where there are games like QPR where Piro just did not, to my eye anyway, did, just did not get into it at all. Just wasn't massively effective. In a team who certainly in the first half were basically effective in every single other position. Um, I thought Ruta a really good game. Um, some of his passing was was absolutely excellent. But Piro, you know, a bit more anonymous. Whereas, whereas there have been other games like Watford, for example, Ipswich and so on, where the, uh, even down at Millwall, where the partnership's been pretty effective um, and has worked. And Farker's answer last night was, I think the numbers are quite good and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. But I think what you're going to have with Piro all season, if I'm being quite honest, is whenever there's a day where it doesn't quite work, whenever there's a day when it isn't, you know, he's quite quiet or isn't as influential as he could be, and he's at 10, people will look at that and say, well, shouldn't he be up front? And the one thing you have to say about last night is that when Banfield came off the bench, there was a change of um, 
not changed system, but there was a switch of personnel, which meant that Ruta went out to the right, Bamford went up front and did play as an out-and-out centre-forward. But I'm still not convinced, actually, that Farker thinks that Pirro is an out-and-out nine. He seems to feel like Pirro's influence is best in a slightly deeper role. I'm kind of unconvinced, I have to say, but you can't deny that between him and Ruta, they've had some, some good performances. Has Ruta surprised you this season? I feel like, for me, I'm discovering he's not quite the player I thought he was. I think through the glimpses we had last year, I thought he's probably more suited to being out wide and he's someone who'll dribble and cut in and shoot. But you've seen from his passing this year, his vision seems to be about the best thing in his game. Yeah, and he also looks like he can play pretty much anywhere um, across the front. He's good in wide areas. Um, He just looks a, a cut above. Some of his passing is really incisive and really hard for defenders to read and, and to manage. Um, and I think he, he's kind of like cheat code level a little bit, isn't he? I think you'll have on and off days with him. You'll have days where it doesn't really work and it, it doesn't flow for him. But I think on the days where he plays well, he'll look better or more skillful than anybody else on the pitch. And that was probably true of last night. Just returning to the road on and the defensive question. Um, I think it's hard to argue that we didn't look a lot more solid at the back last night. I oh, totally I mean, agree. I mean, look, yeah. obviously, you ship a goal after two minutes at St Mary's, it's going to cause a problem. But then to look so porous in that first 35 minutes and you three down, compared to last night, and again, you know, it's, it's maybe it's comparing apples with pears, different side, you know, different abilities. Um, QPR far further down the table, possibly got lesser players, I don't know. Um, but still, just, just the shape seemed better yeah um, and and the fact remains as well that if you look at the first goal and this, and I should say just, I was just going to say this and this isn't a, a dig at Liam Cooper uh, I'm just saying about, talking about the strength of Rodon and what he brings to the defence no I, but I think if you look at the the first goal at Southampton objectively the the change has taken Strike to the right side of the centre back pairing both left footers um, Cooper and, and Strike but Cooper's into that um, left footed zone alongside Byram, you've taken Rodon out of it. And that's where the problem is, you know, for that that goal. That's where the Walker-Peters pass goes through. That's where Armstrong gets in behind. So if you're going to analyse it, you, you're definitely going to look at that. But I totally agree um, about Rodon. I, I think, I mean, one of Rodon's massive strengths seems to be his covering runs, covering defensive runs. He is so good at reading situations that look like they're going to cause Leeds trouble. Um, getting back, there was one... You know, that, that Armstrong chance in the first half, which was the only point at which QPR got anywhere near Melier. Really good ball in behind Strike, but Strike kind of caught in that no man's land where he couldn't react and couldn't get back quickly enough. But Rodon was across to, to cover it. Um, does that an awful lot. But it's quite interesting because we were having a look at the centre backs before the game. And it I, I'd kind of picked up on this after the Cardiff game, but having a look at it in more depth, it was it was far more obvious. It was just how much leads are actually playing through Strike as opposed to anybody else. Like Totten, I know you can make a meal of touches and passes and carries and everything else. But his, generally speaking, are miles beyond anybody else's and, and also, you know, way beyond the, the other centre-backs who Fark's picking from. If you look at Melier's passes out from the back, huge percentage of them are going to strike. You know, that seems to be who he's looking for all the time. And it did kind of make me think that in amongst the debate about Rodon and Cooper, and I do think it's the right decision to be playing Rodon, I wonder actually whether, given how they've set up and given how they're playing, strike is the one that Farker would be least keen to lose from his lineup. Could that be something as simple, though, as the fact that Melier's left-footed passing to Strike is on the same side as him? Because it's, it's, it's easier for Melier to open his body up and pass it that way than it is maybe to, to road on when you're you know, passing across your own body. It's very possible, but I've been watching Strike, and it does seem to me that he offers himself as the free man more often than not. And it, it has it's started to look quite deliberate. I think the numbers make it quite look quite deliberate as well. But I, I think all in all, because of that and because of the way rodon has been since he's come from Spurs you do get it into your head that that is kind of the partnership. That feels to me like the partnership that Leeds can can really build on. And I think it's settled and, and played well enough to this point to to get a decent run. Let's talk about Luke Ayling then, shall we? Because it's mm. Bristol City at the weekend. Obviously, yes. he's, got, he's got links back to there. Um, possibly worth having a, a mention of him because he returned to the side against QPR, had a bit of an off night, Not didn't necessarily do anything wrong, but things didn't go right for him. A lot of the time his touch let him down, you know, it just didn't quite click for him. Yeah, he's in the same boat as Cooper, I think, at the moment. And you could probably add Dallas to this, although with Dallas it's slightly different complexion because it's all about the injury with him, a really severe injury. And Farker was telling us before the QPR game that he'd had a, very sort of minor setback um, after returning to full training, although it sounded like he'd probably be back in full training before the end of this week. And we'll see Farker again tomorrow, Friday, um, before the Bristol City game. So we'll probably get a bit a bit more on that. But they're all at that 
time of their lives, aren't they? Um, and I guess one of the harsh aspects of professional sport for the people who play it is that as your body clock ticks and as time goes on, you naturally get diminishing returns. Um, and, and that's just the way it's going to go. You know, Ailing has less than a year to go on his contract. Cooper has less than a year to go on his. I think I'm right in saying that Dallas is up at the end of, of this season as well, um, 2024. And it becomes a much more difficult decision now, I think, to decide whether to extend those contracts and whether you can expect any more from them, particularly if Leeds were, were to get promoted. Um, I mean, he's, he's 32 ailing and he, he has actually played an awful lot of football through his career. He's He's got more than 500 league starts on his record, going all the way back to, to Yeovil, um, where he started out after Arsenal. And he has been, and I think will always be regarded as, a terrific signing for Leeds. Incredibly high value signing for the money they paid for him. I mean, I always knew that it'd been a fairly cheap fee for him and it had been in the six figures, but it was only when I was writing about him two or three years ago that I found out from somebody that Leeds had paid 200 grand to take him from Bristol City. And Bristol City want, wanted rid of him. Lee Johnson was, was happy to move him on because at the time, the, the defensive structure they were playing, he didn't think that um, Ailing was going to be good enough for them and was going to be able to... Did to he feel like he own. came up a little short? Well, you can say that, but I probably can't. Um, however, <laughs> however, in terms of his tactical plan, he was not quite um, he was not quite up to in Johnson's eyes. But Johnson mm. actually said, "I think we didn't have the to, right stature." Yeah, something like that. Yeah, mm. um, we we went to Ash, Ashton Gate, and um, Johnson did say, "We've been kind of found wanting on mm. that one. We have, you know, we, we've sold him, sold him for not a lot of money. He's been great for Leeds, um, big part of the the promotion team at Leeds." I think, you know, a little bit like the Rodon um, question, I do think if Spence was fit, you would be pushing Spence into the team. They're at totally different ends of the career spectrum. You could almost say the same of Rodon and Cooper, even though Rodon is 25. He, you know, he's quite early in his career in terms of the number of games he's actually played and appearances he's made. He still seems to be trying to find somewhere to settle after Swansea. You know, great move to Tottenham, but hasn't played an awful lot. Spence, you know, Younger again, um, loads and loads of potential proven in this division. Ailing is proven in this division, but he's obviously older now than he was when, when he was playing here last time. Um, but Shackleton was injured last night, shoulder injury for him, so so wasn't in the squad. So it was always going to be Ailing in that slot. It's really hard not to fall back on sentiment when it comes to players like Ailing. Well, anybody who got promoted, basically. It is. I think the important thing is that sentiment doesn't dictate your team choice and you don't pick players because you feel like you don't want to kind of damage their ego or, you know, upset them to a certain degree. You have to be chosen on merit. But I think the important thing with players like Ailing, I always feel this about Cooper as well, is that the the kind of decline, I suppose, of their careers at Leeds and the management of them out of the club, which will have to happen at some stage and happens to everybody eventually, is kind of done respectfully. I mean, Cooper is almost up to testimonial stage now, which is these days quite largely unheard of in football I can't remember the, the last testimonial I saw going on because players just don't stick around at clubs for for that length of time so it has to be a kind of respectful exit I think that applies to Bamford as well whatever you think of his finishing and everything else he did do them a good turn when it mattered um, but nothing lasts forever does it let's move on to Bamford then and the <laughs> Well, it's it's. Look, hands up! In real time, I thought it was a penalty. I thought it was a not a penalty. I I foul. thought he clipped his clipped his foot. Yeah, yeah. I thought he had. It, it, I didn't see it. I'm going to go full Arsene Wenger. I was too far away from it to be able to tell it in any meaningful sense because the game was it was moving fast, wasn't it? And he kind of came across across yeah. him like that, and you'd think, well, I've seen Bamford go down like that before. Presumably, there's some sort of contact. But Michael, you've got a kind Michael's of doing that face. A, a mild grimace on your face. My, my first instinct was, I'm pretty sure he's not touched him. And then I saw it was Bamford and I went, yeah, that probably confirms it. Well, and he, he actually saw what he did as well. There was the pleading hands as well, as if to say, and, and you, you flagged this up on the match ball. Was that him kind of saying, don't book me for diving? I was just trying to get out of the way. Or, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. If you watch it in slow motion, um, it initially... I think he goes down in a way which is almost made to look like there's been contact, um, but then seems to realise straight away, no, there wasn't, and it's going to be quite obvious that there wasn't. And when he got up, there was a kind of sort of half-hearted, um, you know. Do you, remember, do you remember when Robbie Fowler dived at Arsenal mm. um, and won that penalty? And it was a dive. 
And he sort of got up and waved his hands in this wishy-washy way. So yes, rather than yeah. saying to the referee, listen, don't award that, it was kind of like, oh, yeah. might, might not have been too much contact there. It was, it was a little bit like that. I mean, Begovic was absolutely raging. And as time went on, you started to think, if he's that angry, then you would assume yeah. there hasn't been too much in it. But, but, be, but then it descends into pantomime and the crowd then gets on the, you know, get it off, you know. Yeah, going, of course off, it does. Off, off, uh, off. To, and it, and it's, it's always wonderful when an outfield player um, has to go in goal. There's no one near enough of that in um, professional football, I don't think. But the, to be fair to the referee, if he thinks that's a foul, he has to send him off. I mean, if, if there is contact there, that is a definite red card and there's nobody um, arguing with it. But once you watch the replay back, you are starting to think... Mm, don't yeah. think so. It's Not interesting. Sure. QPR fans uh, have launched a petition to have Bamford banned from professional football um, forever, as of as of Thursday. Yes. Oh, okay. So um, that, seems, that that seems quite a pedestrian demand these yeah. days. I thought it was going to be <laughs> executed. Or, you yeah. Know. yeah. Uh, well, the thing is, right. I'm trying to take my Leeds glasses off here and say that if there's any justification for sending him off, it's that. The keeper did lunge and was out of control, regardless of what the outcome was. I mean, Bamford does not make it look good. There's no, you can't pretend no, he did. No, he doesn't. Although he doesn't need to stay, he, he's entitled to get away. He doesn't yeah. need to stay in um, in Begovic's range and take, you know, studs to the knee just so that he can say, oh, there, there absolutely was, was contact. Was yeah. contact. Um, but that should get overturned on appeal. And not least because Ainsworth said straight away afterwards, I've spoken to both of them. They've yeah. both said there was no contact. So unless the FA are going to say, well, it was a lunge with studs up and it was reckless and you were sent off because of that. I think Bigovic will be getting this overturned. I mean, goalkeepers basically do do what they want though, don't they? In terms of their general control of their body. I feel like everywhere yeah. else on the pitch has been really tightened up that you're not allowed to just throw yourself into stuff. But then you see goalkeepers just coming out for crosses and absolutely clearing people out sometimes. Yeah. And it, they do get away with it for the most part. I mean, I thought that about Onana against um, Wolves. In the first game of the season, Man United against... Well, so there was all the arguing about the penalty, which should have been a penalty, and there's another um, apology from the um, PGMOL after after that. Um, but I I thought he could have had an argument for a red card there on the basis that he's completely missed the ball and he's just smashed him in the face. Mm. Um, seems like you know. Um, so it's always a fairly grounds, good one, yeah. grounds for consideration of some disciplinary action. Um, but so you're right, there are occasions where keepers do do that. But outside your box, going for the ball, you've Got to, you, you've got to win it, otherwise you're in trouble. But that doesn't give attacking players the you know the right to dive or to simulate or or whatever else. Um, which Bam- would, Bamford would claim that he was getting out of the way. Which yeah, is, is and, and he, I, I would have been getting out of the way um, mm. with with that coming at you. But I think if it comes back to debate about is it a red card, I don't it's, think it's not. I don't, I think it's, it a, has, it's a yellow. It has it? to get overturned, and it has to be sensible. Is it even a yellow? Well, he's lunging at him for one thing, so, yeah, I suppose so. you could argue yeah. that he... And he's nowhere near the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's... I, I was aware of the commentary on QPR's <laughs> feed, um, which, you know... I, fair to say they were quite partisan. Yes. I, I, I think <laughs> that... Potentially actionable. Yeah. <laughs> there should be more of this. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm all for it. You think they should double down? Yeah. And I think all commentary, I think on Sky as well, when Harry Kane does that thing where he dangles a leg and goes over people, I know he, he, there is con- the thing is, that I don't see much of a difference between Bamford diving with no contact and someone diving when they've the one who's... Oh, he's initiated contact When there. they're the one that's yeah. dragged the leg into someone. I think the commentators would be in their rights to go, oh, he's... He's died to win a penalty there. Massive well slander fest. <laughs> yes, but you can see, you can see like... Bruno Fernandez again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, Grealish was a master at it for a time, wasn't he? I don't know if he's kind of cut that out of his game a little bit under under Pep, but he was he was always trailing the leg, wasn't mm. he? You could see it, and he'd jumping into people and things but, like that. But then again, because the rules the, the rules around football seem to change season to season, and and they've got themselves in a particular pickle with this because of VAR and because everything is scrutinised so much more closely now of trying to decide. So you had that season where any time it hit your hand in the box, it was handball. You know, it was... It was the Robin Cock rule, which well, was then overturned well, the week after. Yeah, it, it, that... B- because Leeds. Yeah, 100%, 100% that. Um, or if, from an attacking point of view, it hits your arm, even if it just glances it and doesn't make any discernible difference, it was disallowed. And then, obviously, that will change because people got a bit sick of it. I'm totally convinced that it will only be a matter of time before there have been far too many goals in 90 plus 13 before that aspect of... Um, of uh, lawmaking gets changed as well. But there were occasions of penalties or there were long stretches of penalties where it did seem as if if you touched anybody in the box and they went down, then it was going to be given. Um, there was a particular period where it seemed like that was particularly true of Old Trafford, but that must have been 
purely coincidental. But eventually, um, you know, players start to cotton on to this and they think, well, if I do get clipped, then it'll be, be a penalty. And I can say, well, touch me. That's that's how it goes. Um, but one way or another, the going by the replay, there was not enough. It would be, it would be stupid if the FA didn't overturn that, I think. You replay the game? Yeah, why not? I mean, <laughs> yeah, every time there's not, a I'm not sure, decision. I, I'm but, not sure I want to sit through that again. I, I'm not saying it was a bad game, but um, we won, like, so let's let's just move on. Championship develops into like 12 games a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes, goes on forever. It, it, As I said, I think the difference it made to the game was that QPR didn't have Dykes to aim at for the last five or six minutes. Um, when they would have obviously scored twice. Well, let's be fair. Am I being facetious? Might, yes, might, I am. Might have scored once, which would have been would have been enough. But it's such a short period of the game that I don't think you can really say that that the the thing that shouldn't happen is that Begovic serves a suspension. Um, but I think I, I mean, talking about the game itself, I'm not sure it's a massive influence, really. Not a good week for refs, does it mean? Really? It's, uh, is it ever? No, no. Mm. no. Who do it? I don't know why, why they do it as a job. Um, Bristol. Which, I was just oh. thinking about this actually. Which games would you replay? What? If, if, it's probably to, easier to, to say dodgy... which, which ones wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, or into dodgy decisions. Well, it's funny, I was chatting, chatting to my dad yesterday about the um, 1973 Cup Winners' Cup final mm. um, in Greece, where I think the, the Greek referee was banned and never um, refed another game mm-hmm. again. But was the game replayed? No. 75, the same. Yeah. yeah. I always so. remember speaking to Lorimer about 75, and he called it the disappointment of the lives. And there's this photo of him, black and white photo, of him sat on the grass staring at the turf after full time and it's like this devastating pick where you can just see what's been taken away from them um, if you speak to Alan Clark I mean he would absolutely never forgive yeah. Beckham Bauer ever I don't think yeah the, the West Brown own goal as well I would replay that game or I'd just overturn the result probably um, which would have I think we would have qualified for the Champions League with that yeah. those points wouldn't we so then we get in the Champions League we don't collapse it ignores the bit where Scum go and score afterwards probably yeah, but if, if we'd have scored that one, then it would have changed the pattern of the game and that definitely wouldn't have happened. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? With, with yeah. these things, you can go, well, you just try to go off and I'll, the score I'll is... Take, I'll take the bits I like. Yeah. But that's you see, that's the, the basis of this whole argument, which is why it's completely ridiculous, is that it's all on the assumption that the entire scenario and end result would have been different. See, mine comes from the, the Burley season at Hearts, which was a game against Celtic at Tynecastle where Hearts 1-0 up. And Maloney went over a player called Fisas, very good Greek defender, um, no contact. Fisas got sent off. Um, they won the game three two, and it was pretty key in the you know kind of title race. Not that we'd necessarily have won it, but we we're in in the hunt. Um, but the same thing applies, doesn't it? Number of times Celtic beat us eleven v eleven is well almost endless. So yeah, it's um, I think the it's other something or nothing. But yeah, we could replay last night. The other one, the whole whole game doesn't need replaying, but a goal needs chalking off for the Gordon Watson dive. Yeah, absolutely. That should have been six 0 And he yeah. should have been sent off. And, yeah. and banned from football. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say if you've had VAR, then get to the screens for that one, ref. <laughs> so he maintains there was contact on that. Yeah, but because it, he's a liar. Yeah, <laughs> in your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, he did. He did. I mean, and this for the for the record for anybody who's who's under about forty, going, what is he on about? Nineteen ninety one, ninety two mm. season, and we're still Every, we're everybody's still, seen that surely. But we're still yeah. bitter about it. Yeah, yeah just, just search Gordon Watson dive. It'll, yeah. be, the, it'll yeah. be the first thing that comes up. Yeah, and he, yeah, he maintains there was contact, but it, was it contact that caused him to take another two steps and then dive in the air? If you search yeah. Gordon Watson lie, you'll probably get him talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> in your opinion, in my opinion, <laughs> Michael Normanton should say those are very much the opinions of Michael Normanton <laughs> and not me. I'll leave, or... I'll leave I still covering <laughs> your backs. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask: um, Should we move on to? preview Bristol quickly because uh, that's coming up um, hot on the heels of the QPR game they're just behind us in the table played this obviously same number of games um, they've won four drawn three lost three so um, not too far off where we are um, what do we expect? They were in Yorkshire um, on Wednesday night and I would assume must be staying up in this neck of the woods would make an awful lot of sense to bomb back down to um, to Bristol and then back up again but I might be wrong they've looking through their squad it's quite Solid, I think. It's quite, uh, not wildly strong, but I think it's a... Grizzled? Very... Championship? Yeah, maybe grizzled. It's got Naki Wills in it. Not God, it's, yeah, but he's been there since forever. He left Bradford, yeah. went to Bristol and has been there for, yeah, that, I think, 25 isn't that, years. Isn't that the crux of being grizzled in the championship that yeah. you've been around? Naki yeah. Wells, of course, featured last night, didn't he, as people dug out the... Um, That's right. The tweet uh, from yes. QPR. That's right. When he unballed it. Did yeah. he unball it twice, I think, in that? Replay that one too. Yeah, but... <laughs> 
They were, yeah, they, what, were they, what was the tweet? It was uh, no VAR, no problem. Or something Indeed, like that. Yeah, yeah huh, funny. Yeah, of which, what goes around comes around. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, so they, they beat Rotherham. What else have they done? Let's have a look. So they've uh, they lost to Stoke at home, lost to Leicester away, beat Plymouth 4 1 at home, 0 0 against West Brom, and then they won at Swansea, uh, among others. I, I think they're quite a decent side, Bristol City. Um, but I wouldn't. I, I can't really go further than that at this stage. And, and whether or not that means that they're going to have a look in with the playoffs or not um, is is quite difficult to say. But they are in that massive clutch of clubs who are on kind of 16, 15 points at the moment, um, above and, and below sixth place. Um, yeah, they won very late at Rotherham. Um, 95th minute, I think. We're watching the goal um, just in the press room as we got in after the QPR game. So... I think a more difficult game on Saturday um, than QPR, but one which will probably shape up in much the same way. Yeah, will they have a, maybe a bit? I was going to say, will they have a bit more ambition? But I think you've answered the question there almost. Um, if it'll be more difficult, surely they offer more going forwards. As a you know, that's the natural conclusion you'd draw from hearing that. Yeah, well, Ishmael at Watford. Um, who did that great tweet this week of statement. Um, I, I mentioned this on the yeah, match ball. Yeah, yeah, you thought, oh, he's been oh, fired. He's gone. Yeah, and he read it. He's got a new contract. Ah. And that must have been deliberate. I mean, there can't be anybody at Watford who who did that unknowingly and, you know, without thinking, oh, people might think he's he's had the bullet because they're very much getting into championship managers getting the bullet territory now. Um, but he, he's got a bit of a reputation for his football being... Slight sort of madness, you know, slightly chaotic and everything else. It just was not like that. Um, and, I, I, you know, it's always hard to tell, a bit like QPR in the first half last night, whether that's because of how well Leeds are playing and how well Leeds are controlling everything or whether they're just not very good or the tactics are incredibly unambitious. But, I mean, the trend is already set, isn't it? It doesn't look like... Th- there are a couple of sides who are probably going to come here and try and go punch for punch. I suspect Southampton probably would... Absolutely certain Leicester will, without a doubt, maybe Ipswich. But most of the clubs in the Championship are probably going to do what we've seen already. That's becoming a, a definite pattern and I think it will continue. What do you fancy then for the weekend? Another home win? I feel like we should... We are better than the vast majority of teams yeah. in this in this division, which is what I was saying before about the, the which seems to be the, the way that, you know, talking of patterns, the way that this season is going. Um, so I, I go into every game sort of quietly optimistic thinking, yeah, there's no reason why we shouldn't win this. Um, and what, well, it's what we've done in the show in the last week or two, isn't it? Trying to find reasons why Leeds won't win stuff. It um, it will need graft again. Um, I would expect Bristol City to have. I mean, it's not that difficult, but I would expect them to have more chances than QPR. Um, but without the, the numbers necessarily being vast, it's winnable. I think again, and to go back to the table because of what's going on at the very top of it. Um, unless you want to get um. Unless you want to get relegated into the conversation about the playoffs and nothing else at a fairly early stage, you do have to keep that gap to a fairly acceptable level. So I think Leeds will have done that um, if they can get a win from the back end of this week as well. Uh, But, I mean, Leicester's form is pretty extraordinary at the moment. 27 points in 10 games is, you know, that that should be the the jump to get them back out of the division at at the first attempt, really. And, And they're going to be difficult to catch. But it was after Southampton, it was always pretty crucial that they made a lot of these two games. Rotation. Talk to me about rotation. Do you keep Jaden Anthony in? Because I was quite impressed with him. Against yeah, and QPR. I was a little bit surprised that he came off. I wasn't surprised that Pirro came off. I thought that was coming. Um, but I, it seemed to me that Somerville had become less influential than Anthony in the second half. But Anthony was starting for the first time for Leeds. Obviously, he hadn't been here through pre-season and, and everything else. So it might have been that, that Farker was just protecting him to a degree. I think on the strength of his performance, I would definitely leave him in the team. Um, I think I would probably go unchanged, really. Um, right. If if Byram can cope with um, a third game in a week, uh, I don't think I'd be shifting it up too much. I don't know where Shackleton is injury-wise. Uh, again, we'll find out from Farker before the game um, whether he's got a chance or not. But um, yeah, I wouldn't be shifting, shifting it around too much. One to watch. Did we do one for QPR? I can't remember. Um, <laughs> one of the main features no, of the. I don't, uh... I don't think so. I, I I lay this on you, really. If you ask, I'll I'll answer. Um, if uh, if you don't, then, then I right. Won't. Well, QPR's but... one to watch was Somerville. There we go. Um, yeah. Well, well, let's retrofit that or Rodon again. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it was Rodon, I think. Actually, yeah. if we did do one, if not, we thought about it. And um, probably Piro, really, because it was a quiet night for him last night. And there is this what what I think is just going to be this ongoing debate about where the Rodrigo problem. Yes, you could say that, although it's only a problem if it's not working more often than not, if that, mm-hmm. that makes sense. And I think the problem with Rodrigo at 10 was it just didn't feel like it was 
ever really clicking in a kind of spectacular way. Um, Piro needs to have bigger games than that. Needs to needs to be more um, more involved than that. I think especially when Ruter is playing in the way that he is, you know, the, the, the scope to get on the end of chances and to, to make the most of, of Ruta's play is, is definitely there. So yeah, let's see what, what happens with him. Because as I say, that seemed that there's been the Rodon and Cooper debate um this week, but I think the one that's probably gonna become most intense is depending on what happens as time goes on, will be, you know, how Pirro is being used. So I'm gonna put my neck on the block and say Pirro to score leads to win on Saturday. I mean I I always think Leeds are gonna win. Even when it's mm. quite clearly obvious we're not going to do. Well, like 3 0 down at Southampton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can do this, lads. <laughs> yeah, 4 3, honestly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, go, I mean, like from, you know, from a a completely like neutral standpoint with regards to that, I'm not, without being too overly optimistic, let's have him back in the goals and let's get a win. I'd take another 1 0. I think you, I think you should. I mean, it's savvy manager um, at Bristol City. Um, they'll, they'll be set up well, I think. It wouldn't be a bad result. What are you going for? I've been criticised for being optimistic on, at points this season, so I will go for it. Has, it has, it has no, it has no bearing on the fact. outcome. It's no bearing on no. the outcome. I always used to say this to people. I know, but it doesn't stop people having to go, though, does it? No. Um, but that's what you deserve. Yeah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> God, I've got a Watson's bloody lies coming at me as well. <laughs> next week, so I've got, I've got bigger, bigger fish to fry. Um, it's funny, we were talking about litigation, weren't we, in terms of Levi's listeners last true. night, weren't we? That'll be fun to watch. Yeah, let's win 1 0. Yeah, fine. Okay, I'm happy with that. Do you feel? Do you feel a, a home win in your waters, Phil? I know we don't want to get into prediction territory too much, but good chance. The yeah. good thing chance. with the yeah. thing with two home games back to back after a defeat, you can just put it right completely. Yeah, six six points out of nine is fine. If you can do that through the season, you're on track, aren't you? So you yeah. can draws can kill you in this league. So losing it, the odd one with with wins thrown around it is fine. It yeah. always helps as well if two back to back you make the best of the first game. Um, so that people don't go into the second one saying, "Well, we really do need to win this," um, mm-hmm. or really could do with, with winning this. I think it was it was kind of job done last night, which which should help. Yes, right. Well, we will um, we'll wrap the show up there. Um, just to say, so we'll be back on Monday, Phil. And we'll um, dissect what happens against Bristol, but there'll be no show going into the international weekend on Friday the thirteenth. Too unlucky. We can't mm. can't do that on um, on Friday the thirteenth. But we do have over that weekend. It's the four part kit special with Ed Cowburn who um, designed the Leeds United kits this year it's really really good going to really like release them across the weekend it's good so find out how it came about talk about the home kit the away kit and the um, the Rubab and Custard third kit and a reminder you can get mugs as well you can get mugs these mugs back in stock again we just have to, we just have to keep getting more of them yeah. Daniel Farker un- unbelievable hard they're selling unbelievable well aren't they they're unbelievable well um, someone did get one into the ground yesterday as well I'm, I was pleased to report them oh right so he's, we might be able to sell them there then he says unbelievable so much in press conferences that I can't decide now whether to quote him as unbelievably or to quote him as unbelievable considering that he's clearly not meaning to say it unbelievable um, but everybody is now latched on to unbelievable and would fully expect in tweets you to write, write unbelievable yeah mm. What a dilemma, dilemma. right? Yeah. Right, we'll wrap it up there then. The squareball.net for all that stuff. We'll see you later. The Squareball Podcast. 